Okay. Hi. Hey. Right. I think I think we can uh, we can start. Okay. Um, so we are going to record this and uh, then put it online. You you are you okay with that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Just warning you. I mean, in yeah. case if you don't want to, we can edit out some parts. Okay. So, uh, Gregoire is doing it. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think you can start the recording. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we're very happy to have well here with us virtually. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't make it in person, but at least let's say we can have him here on the screen, uh, talk, uh, talk us and presenting his work. And it's uh, Stefan Veni, uh, who's an assistant professor at Alto University. And uh, he's been uh, working both towards improving our understanding of the brain and our understanding of application machine learning. And we'll see probably a bit of both today. And thanks, Stefan. And uh, yeah, very exciting about this one. Thank you, uh, Luigi, for the kind invitation. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for joining this uh, seminar. Uh, so I, I'm sorry I couldn't come uh, physically. It, it turns out that this morning uh, uh, my son felt sick and, and then uh, my wife felt sick. And, and then I realized I felt sick myself and it I felt it's better if I just don't come here and make you all sick. Um, so, but I really hope you can still um, ask questions. So I see Luigi that you just muted uh, the seminar room. So I'm not sure how you, you will be able to ask any question if, if it's muted. Um. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no no worries, let's say, I mean, uh, just, you know, to kind of remove the background noise in case, you know, since we're, we are recording this, uh, but if someone has questions, let's say, I mean, I, I suppose I can sit closer and then quickly switch this on. Okay, please do so. Yeah, I think that would be nice. Um, anyways, okay, so um, yeah, so I, I'll present the efforts uh, of, of the lab. So um, uh, basically uh, all the work I will be presenting uh, today is, is work in progress. Uh, and and um, the goal of this work is to model uh, mental rotation, uh, which we will see in a second uh, what it is. Um, so there's been uh, some some efforts uh, since uh, the um, uh, since the early um, uh, successes of uh, of deep learning uh, to compare uh, representations uh, learned by Deep networks and uh, representations uh, found in uh, in uh, in the uh, neurons in the brain, um, and um, these uh, efforts have been uh, partly successful, in the sense that uh, nowadays uh, deep networks are the best models uh, we have uh, to recapitulate the activations of neurons uh, in the visual system. So, um, for instance, uh, in this paper of 2014, uh, they were uh, training a deep network, and uh, this network was simply trained on uh, an image recognition task. And then they would look at the neural activations in the layers of this deep network and compare uh, these uh, representations to those found in different areas of here, the brain of a macaque uh, with electrodes uh, recording from, from, it, from the neurons in its brain. And I, I won't go into the details, but what they find um, uh, in summary is that uh, there is a correspondency between uh, early layers in the deep network and um, visual areas that are close to the retina, in a sense, that are closely connected with the retina. And then uh, uh, layers that are further um, um, down the, 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 the neural network are also um, uh, have representations that look like those found in uh, areas of the brain that are further down the visual stream. Um, so this is kind of nice, 
Um, but I will argue here uh, that it's not um, giving us the full picture of uh, what the visual system does. Um, and so if you stare at this mosaic, um, and if you're like me, you, you might see some uh, patterns um, appear and disappear, uh, some circles maybe of different sizes or any other grouping of these little elements into patterns. And I think that's a nice uh, illustration of how uh, uh, seeing is uh, really close, uh, closely interrelated to interpretation and, and uh, that we actually need to uh, interpret uh, everything uh, we see. And um, that is interesting because um, in this context, in, in, for this particular image, we can see that this uh, interpretation is a, is a dynamical um, process. So that can uh, vary uh, in time. And so that is not consistent with the picture of a, of a, a, a deep net where um, the image is simply propagated uh, forward into the layers of a deep net and then the deep net reaches uh, a single conclusion about what is present in the image. Um, so what could be there in the visual system that makes it uh, different than deep networks? Well, what is known ad anatomically is that the visual system is a highly um, recurrent network compared to uh, deep networks. So in, in deep in classical deep networks for vision, you have the image coming in a first uh, la layer and then propagated to the next layer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, the visual system is organized pretty differently uh, because already at the first cortical relay here, you have uh, a strong feedback coming to uh, that relay uh, that is just uh, after the retina uh, in the thalamus. And um, actually this feedback is very important because 90% uh, of the connections uh, to this region, uh, to this region in the thalamus, comes from the cortex and not from the retina. Only 10% of connections come from the retina. Uh, so, so the brain is a, is a highly recurrent circuit. Um, you have so these feedback uh, connections from the different areas, different cortical areas as well. And you also have a uh, recurrent connection uh, within areas. So uh, V1 is a circuit that is uh, highly recurrent so the primary visual system is a circuit that is highly recurrent itself. Um, and this uh, recurrence might indeed be key uh, to um, do vision like uh, us humans uh, do. And that was uh, demonstrated in this uh, article uh, from Car et al. Um, in the following way. So they presented those uh, images that they made themselves uh, to AlexNet. And they found the images that AlexNet were um, classifying correctly. And they called these uh, the control images. And the images that were classified incorrectly by AlexNet, these are called the challenge images. And they presented those to uh, a primate and measured the time with which uh, they, the time they needed to decode the identity of the object from uh, electrodes located in uh, an area of the primate visual system called IT, which is the area where object recognition happens. And uh, what they found in a nutshell, is that images that do, doesn't uh, are not problematic for the deep net can be decoded uh, earlier in time than uh, images that uh, are challenging for the deep net. So you can see those two histograms represent uh, time histograms, and um, you can see that when it comes to these challenging images, uh, on average. Uh, the primate um, the primate circuit takes more time to convert to the correct uh, to the correct answer. 
And uh, from, from this observation, uh, they uh, concluded that probably uh, recurrent connections are involved when it comes to these uh, recognizing these uh, challenging images. Uh, the problem with this um, result is that it is not completely clear what makes um, challenging images uh, challenging. Uh, we just know that they follow deep nets, but we don't have any more quantification of what is meant by, by challenging here. And uh, the counter, counterpart question is, so we don't know either what is happening in the brain uh, to process these challenging images. <clears throat> so recurrent connections might uh, indeed be involved, but we don't know how or why. So here we'll focus on another process that is known to also take time, uh, to uh, take time uh, in the brain. And this process is called mental rotation. So mental rotation is the, is the process consisting in uh, comparing these two, um, uh, comparing two figures that come in different, uh, are seen from a different viewpoint. And um, the question that uh, is asked is whether these two figures are the same uh, up to a rotation or if they are different. Uh, so here, um, uh, maybe someone in the audience uh, can tell me if 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 they think that uh, these two are the same. Any idea? <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. Okay. I I hear a yes, and that is um, that is uh, I think correct. Um, and uh, so maybe uh, we can also ask the question for these two here in panel C. Uh, do you think that these two are the same or not? No. <laughs> yes, I, I hear no, and that is also the correct answer. Um, in this case, these are mirror images actually of, of each other. And <clears throat> what uh, was really striking when they uh, run the, these experiments on many people for many hours is that they found that on average, people take a time to respond that is proportional to the angle of rotation between the two shapes. So you can see that uh, linear fit is quite perfect to explain the data here. Um, and you can see, so for uh, a, a small angle of rotation, people can respond in an, an average of one second. But when it comes to uh, 180 degrees, people can take up to five seconds to answer this uh, question. So it, it takes uh, much more time. Uh, the difference between these two uh, figures is that in, in one case, they were doing the rotation in the plane of the image as if the, the, the figure here was kind of a sticker that they would just rotate around. And in the second case, they did the experiment with uh, in-depth rotation, so 3D rotation, uh, and they find a very similar uh, phenomenon. The, they couldn't distinguish uh, the, the slope for, for this reaction time slope and this reaction time slope. Okay, so that is a process that is likely using these recurrent connections in the visual system. And is a process, it's also a process that is uh, well characterized, well known, and that we can hope to model and understand. Um, one thing I'd like to add is that um, this process uh, is uh, so mental rotation has also been observed for for natural objects it's not just for these uh, geometric figures and uh, so here is a, is an experiment where they were showing uh, these drawings in different orientation and they find a, a similar phenomenon that people would take a time to um, uh, recognize to name 
the object that is proportional to the angle of rotation of the object. So if the object is upside down, 180 degree, uh, the, response were, the response was slower than if the object was upright here, zero degree. They, they did find a, a dip here at 180 degree. It seems that when the object is uh, perfectly upside down, people are slightly faster on average than uh, when the object is, um, is, is uh, slightly uh, off. Um, but but this uh, phenomenon is is uh, highly highly reproducible. Okay, so the the question we'll try to address here is, um, is that process of mental rotation really critical for recognizing objects in unusual poses, and and do humans uh, actually outperform deep networks in recognizing objects in unusual poses? And then the second question is, uh, what is happening in the brain when we perform mental rotation? And can we model that for deep learning? So um, here with uh, Amur Abbas, um, we ran uh, these experiments where we produced uh, realistic objects uh, in all possible orientations and presented them to uh, various uh, deep networks. So here it's a visual transformer, uh, a network released by Google in, in 2020. And we can see that uh, as the, this object uh, progressively rotates, uh, the answer, the prediction of the network, these are the top five predictions, uh, they, become, uh, they become wrong. So here we, we see uh, uh, that the network predicts a binocular. Um, and yeah, I, I, I usually stop here because it, it's kind of interesting. It, it predicts an assault rifle. And I think like maybe there's something to it. Like this could be the cannon. Uh, this could be some kind of trigger. Uh, I, I'm not really an expert in assault rifle, but I can see something maybe a little bit like an assault rifle. Yet uh, my visual system tells me that this is absolutely not uh, the correct answer. Um, so we ran that uh, uh, study uh, really exhaustively uh, using a range of, of networks that we could find uh, pre-trained, uh, publicly available. And what we found is that, uh, so the colored bars here indicate the accuracy of these networks on our objects when they were in unusual poses. And the gray bars uh, are the accuracy of the networks when the objects are upright. And you can see that all the networks we tested have a drop in accuracy when it comes to recognizing these objects in unusual poses. Uh, when we try to understand what are the, the, most, the best networks, the best performing networks, uh, what we find is that it has nothing to do with uh, uh, the training loss, uh, whether it's self-supervised or supervised or text, textually supervised. Uh, doesn't seem to matter that much. The architecture doesn't seem to matter either. So this coloring of the bars here corresponds to the different architectures that we tested from transformers to confnets, etc. None of this seems to really matter. What does seem to matter is the size of the model and the size of the training set. Because we find that our best two models, these are the champions, noisy students, efficient net, L2 and, and SWAG. Uh, one is released by Google and the other one by uh, Facebook. And what we see is that they have hundreds of millions of parameters. And also the size of the training set is enormous. So for noisy student, we have 300 million images. This is the G JFT uh, 300 uh, data, data set. And uh, for SWAG, uh, the model was trained on 3.6 billion images of Instagram in a self uh, weekly supervised way. Um, and so really the sheer size of the data set and the sheer size of the model seems to make a difference in robustness. Yet, uh, even these models train on uh, extremely large data sets that are um, not completely robust. Here, I'll show you an example of uh, a, failure, a failure mode of our best model tested, uh, noisy student efficient net. <clears throat> and uh, 
and so you can see that as as these uh, as this uh, vehicle rotates, um, well, there there is some confusion into into what this vehicle is. Um, okay, so we wanted to uh, go all the way into um, because so we ha we had a hint with the study that uh, indeed uh, networks are are less robust than the visual system, but we actually wanted to uh, actually test also uh, humans uh, on these uh, objects to see whether indeed uh, consistently with our intuition uh, humans are indeed more robust to unusual poses. So for this, we uh, generated um, a, a data set of objects uh, rotated in all possible uh, poses, uh, presented it to a network, and we have three scenarios. The object presented upright, and we ask uh, a human a human subject uh, whether it's one of, of, of two labels. Uh, one is the correct label, and one is the uh, second best label predicted by uh, the deep net uh, noisy noisy student. Then we have a rotated correct condition. This is a condition where the network was um, correct, where noisy student was correct. And same, we use the correct uh, label and also the second best label that was predicted by a uh, noisy student as an alternative. And then we have a rotated incorrect condition. This is a condition where the network got it wrong. So here the network thought it was a drum, whereas it's actually a pitcher. And here we propose to the human laborer two possible labels, either drum, which is the incorrect label, or pitcher, which is the correct one. <clears throat> uh, by the way, this this is work done uh, with by Netta Olika in, in collaboration with Marco, who is uh, at University of Helsinki. And um, we have the following uh, results with humans. We find that when given unlimited times, humans are actually uh, very good at naming the object. They have uh, an average of 95% accuracy, <clears throat> whether the object is upright or whether the object is rotated. And even in the condition where the, the object is rotated in a way that fooled the network, uh, the human the human labeler is actually um, most of the time correct. And uh, the second interesting observation is that if we uh, limit viewing time, so in the limited case, um, uh, the object is only flashed to the person for 40 milliseconds, then we see a, a big reduction in accuracy when we project, when we when we put the object in a rotated position compared to when the object is upright. The reason we, we run that limited viewing condition is that uh, by limiting the viewing time, we think that this perturbs the recurrent processes that might happen in the visual system, right? So these, these recurrent processes are acting on a, a representation that has to be sustained for some time. And we think that if we present the object only for a limited amount of time, uh, that sustained representation uh, isn't there. And so the recurrent process can't really take place as it should. Um, so here we, we show that humans with unlimited viewing time, they perform very well on, this, uh, on unusual poses, even those that were incorrectly classified by the best deep network of our collection. And with limited viewing time, humans make uh, many mistakes uh, on objects in unusual poses. And this is a little bit more like deep networks. Right. So, okay. So if everyone is, is now convinced that uh, humans uh, actually outperform deep networks for recognizing objects in unusual poses, we can ask uh, the, the question, what is happening in the brain when we perform uh, this mental rotation? Uh, 
And for this, we started with uh, a student of the lab uh, who has left since then, Alexander uh, Krylov, um, who has um, um, a proposed a, a, a model. Um, this model was uh, actually uh, inspired by uh, Dupont et al. Um, and it, it goes as follow. So we think of um, the mental rotation process as taking place in a latent representation of an autoencoder. So here's the setup. We have an autoencoder here that whose goal is to take as an input a view of uh, a Metzler shape to encode it. And here the decoder uh, is supposed to produce um, uh, the same shape, but seen from another angle. Right, so we train this autoencoder with pairs of shape um, that are the same shape uh, with a different uh, uh, viewpoint. And the, the twist of this autoencoder is that here we have a, a latent operator, which is acting on uh, uh, an abstract representation here that is, uh, that is uh, um, organized in a 3D tensor. So we have that 3D tensor that is, uh, that to which we apply a, a rotating operator such that this 3D tensor is, is uh, actually uh, rotated as if we would uh, rotate um, a, a 3D voxel representation of the, of the object here. And then this is sent to the decoder. Right, so we train this autoencoder with this uh, latent operator on, on many pairs of, of these shapes. Uh, one question that might arise is how do we choose the angle of rotation here? Well, <clears throat> we, we use it, we have it, because here we know which angle of rotation uh, was used between uh, to generate those uh, pairs. And so we use that specific angle of rotation here in our uh, parameterization of this rotation operator. Right, so we trained this uh, autoencoder um, on, uh, on many pairs of shape. And then at test time, we can see whether uh, it, it succeeds. And in order to see if it's uh, actually working, uh, the pairs of shapes that we use at test time are different than the pairs of shape that we've seen during training. So it's, it's, it's not the same shapes. So we see if the network is able to generalize to unseen shapes. <clears throat> and what we find is the following is that um, most of the time, uh, the network is actually able to predict. So here, from one view of a shape, it's actually able to predict what that shape would look like from any other view. Here is the ground truth of the view, and here is the predicted other view. And you can see a very nice match. So most of the time, it, it gets it right. Um, as you can see, for instance, here as well and here. <clears throat> but there are some exceptions. Here is uh, one exception where here is the ground truth view and here is the predicted view. And you can see that there's a missing cube. How come there's a missing cube here in that one? Well, if we look at the uh, original shape that was uh, original view that was presented, well, this cube is invisible because it's hidden behind the object. And so it is actually a very hard guessing game for the network to guess uh, what is uh, happening behind that object. It kind of seems to guess there is something that might be because all the shapes in our training set, they have the same number of cubes. They are made of 10 cubes. <clears throat> so maybe by seeing that, okay, here there's only nine visible cubes, the network could infer that there must, there must be a 10th cube somewhere here. So it's, it's kind of maybe gets a glimpse of it, but uh, it not completely. But that kind of um, rises a, a more general problem than that in general, it's impossible to get what is behind a, a, an object 
because um, there's not just not enough information there that we can uh, correctly guess uh, exactly the, for instance, the texture that would be at the back of an object. So it, this problem totally makes sense. And so the next step that we're trying to get at now is to um, avoid this problem of predicting pixels altogether because this is too difficult and uh, to uh, change the model so that it looks something like that, where instead of trying to predict pixels, we are now try trying to just work in uh, that latent representation space. And what we want to is uh, to build um, a representation such that once we apply the correct rotation operator of that block here, we obtain a match with uh, the block here corresponding to the to the rotated view. So this is called equivalence, uh, an equivalent representation for those who, who know that. So how can we do such a thing? Well, we can use the same uh, uh, the same uh, mechanism as self-supervised learning because self-supervised learning does precisely that. It matches uh, representations of uh, of distorted uh, input images. Uh, it's not uh, exactly the same as self-supervised learning because now we have the presence of this uh, latent operator uh, in the in the latent space. So unlike, so self-supervised learning is just trying to learn some invariant representation to the distortions that are sent uh, as an input. Here, we're trying to learn some equivalent representation to the distortion. And that is, that is interesting because now our latent space is gonna be structured in such a way that after training, we can uh, manipulate the latent representation with this latent operator and that allows the, the, the model to uh, simulate or imagine uh, different scenarios that has never been seen during, uh, during training. Right, so this is, this is work in progress for which I have nothing to, to show for at the, at the moment. Um, but let's come back to the original motivation is to um, actually um, model mental rotation in the brain, right? So is this model consistent with uh, what is happening in the brain? Maybe, maybe not. So how do we know? Well, what would be nice is if this model makes a prediction that we could then test in the brain by doing some experiments. And, 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 and if we can uh, prove that the prediction is correct, that would be evidence in favor of that type of model. Well, one uh, interesting element in this model is like, if you think of the mental rotation task, um, so the mental rotation task would consist in, so we need to compare those two uh, shapes. So the visual system would encode shape one and then encode shape two and then somehow try to find the correct angle here to match shape one to shape two. But there is no knowledge a priori of what that angle is. And so there's different strategies that could be employed by the brain. Either there could be a simple progressive rotation with elementary steps until the, until the, correct, pose is, the correct pose is found, or uh, there could be some more sophisticated mechanism to infer what that angle is. You could have some trial and error rotations until the, the correct pose is, is, is found using uh, this uh, more sophisticated heuristic. So we came back to uh, the data from the experiment of uh, Metzler and Shepard. So this, this is the original experiment where they're comparing the shapes. Since uh, this experiment, uh, uh, another team has actually reproduced uh, this data and, and made it um, available uh, in open access. So we could just uh, take that data from them and um, actually reanalyze that data. 
And what we did is that instead of simply plotting the average as a function of rotation angle, we plotted the distribution of reaction times. So you can see here for uh, the angle zero, we have a, a dis uh, an entire distribution of reaction time instead of just an, an average. And the blue histogram corresponds to when the shapes were actually the same. And the purple uh, histogram is when the shapes were actually uh, mirror images of each other. And uh, some interesting uh, pheno phenomena uh, were, were not seen in the original study. Um, the first thing that is notable is here, there's a big difference in the histograms when the shapes are the same and when the shapes are mirror images of each other when it comes to uh, uh, zero angle rotation. So there is zero angle of rotation between the two shapes. <clears throat> this is this is kind of interesting. We don't really know why why that is. But the second uh, interesting uh, thing about those histograms is how wide they are. And for instance, here for the highest possible angle tested, 150 degree, you see how here there's some very fast reaction times that are actually pretty close to the reaction time, uh, to the fastest reaction time when the objects are upright. So that seems to invalidate this idea that uh, there would be a progressive uh, mental rotation at a steady, uh, at a steady rate, uh, because that, that would be difficult to explain that sometimes actually people can be very fast. And by the way, these um, red and orange bar here indicate their error rates. So you can see that even at these very fast reaction times, uh, people are much better than chance. <clears throat> so this was observed by uh, Matthias Kobonen, and uh, by diving uh, uh, more in the literature, he, he found this interesting discrepancy between two studies. So this is the original study of Shepard and Metzler, where you see how these reaction times, they go from one second to almost to more than four seconds as a function of the angle of rotation. But this study has been reproduced in 1988 by uh, Shepard and Metzler. So the, the funny thing here is that this is not the same Shepard. Here it's Roger Shepard, but here it's Shena Shepard and it's not the same Metzler. This is Douglas Metzler and this was Jacqueline Metzler. So another team of Shepard and Metzler, um, like 10 years, yeah, 16 years later, 17 years later, they, they reproduced the study. And they found this interesting thing that the slope in their case was between one second and a little bit less than three seconds, a little bit more than one second, a little bit less than three seconds. So this slope is actually very different than this slope. In that paper, they, they didn't even comment on that discrepancy because they were looking at something completely different. They were comparing the rotation uh, reaction time for 3D objects versus uh, 2D objects. And uh, so here we, we try to find all the differences between those two studies that could explain this discrepancy. And uh, what we noticed as a difference is that in the first study, in the original study, they had 10 angles of rotation, 10 possible angles of rotation. And the second study, the later one, they had only five angles of rotation. And by adjusting the slope by a factor of two, uh, we find that actually there's a good match between the two studies. So what does it mean to adjust that slope? <clears throat> It kind of says, imagine that you can go twice faster in your rotation rate. Um, 
if you know that there's only five possible angles of rotation, uh, that would correspond to a, a slope adjusted with uh, a factor of two. So if this is confirmed, it would suggest that people can be faster at mental rotation when the number of rotation angles explored is, is small. And this is, so we're working to confirm that with more experiments at the moment. But if that turns out to be correct, um, that would suggest that indeed uh, this <clears throat> mental rotation uh, phenomenon happening in the brain is, is much more than just a, a progressive rotation with elementary steps. It, it's more uh, like in line with hypothesis two that there is some kind of clever heuristic that uh, decides which angles of rotations are, are explored at any given time. So this is uh, to be continued, but uh, this is what we learned so far. We learned that humans are, are better at recognizing objects in unusual poses than deep networks. We have an elementary model of uh, mental rotation that is using a rotation operator acting in latent space. We don't know if that is what the brain is doing, but uh, at least we have a model. And we have some evidence already that humans, they do not just explore all the possible rotations sequentially, nor even at a fixed rate. <clears throat> so it's unclear what they do, but we know that they don't do the simplistic explanations that were given at the, at the time where Shepard and Metzler had uh, found, uh, uh, showed the, the mental rotation reaction times. And uh, one, one last thing I want to just um, uh, show very quickly is that we are also looking directly into the brain at what is happening when we present these objects in a unusual uh, orientations. Right now we have, uh, by reanalyzing data that was already collected by the lab of Conkol and Alvarez that they also made open access. And this is uh, fMRI data. So they showed this um, list of objects here in um, different orientations. And then they recorded uh, um, the, are the areas that correspond to the early visual system um, and then the later um, areas of the visual system. And by computing what they called uh, dissimilarity maps, they find the, the, the emergence of uh, invariant representation to these uh, rotations. Uh, the way to see that is, so these little cubes here means mean that the representation of this object presented in all uh, eight possible orientation, or sorry, I think it's five possible orientation, all look alike. And this dark shade, shade indicates that the representations to these um, five orientation look alike. So the formation of these cubes indicate that as you go deeper in the visual system, you see the emergence of invariant representation to orientation. Here in the early visual system, you might notice that there's already a cube formed, but this is for the strawberry, which is kind of a round object. So as you rotate it, it already looks like itself. So it kind of makes sense that even in the early relay, you have, you have that block appearing. But later on, you see those blocks appearing for other objects they do not have uh, they do not have uh, that rotation uh, invariance to them. Um, so of course, this is this is interesting, but uh, what we're missing with fMRI data is the dynamics of that process. So we think that recurrence is playing a role into uh, making these uh, invariant representations. The problem is that fMRI has a time resolution of one second, and that might be too slow to really see these dynamics take place. So right now we're reproducing a similar data set uh, using uh, MEG uh, recordings, which, uh, which have a, a much better temporal resolution. So that's what we're, we're trying to do at the moment. And, and with that, I'll thank uh, all my lab members and, and collaborators, and uh, I'll open up for your questions.
Thanks. Thanks, fantastic talk. Very, very interesting. So let's see if there is any question first from the audience. Otherwise, I have a question. Uh, so yeah, so you, you brought up uh, recurrence again at the end because I was about to ask you about that. Uh, because uh, you started essentially saying that you know recurrence is important. There must be some top-down connections. They're doing uh, a, a lot of the, you know a lot of work in the human brain or in primate brains and brains in general. And uh, so your current model doesn't have any recurrence. So let's say so where are you going to put it in? Uh, how? Yeah, that's a, a good point. So um, here, this uh, rotation operator, um, when you think of it, what it's doing is a re-indexing of, um, of neurons, right? You have like that uh, three, three D grid of neurons. And then every time you apply that operator, it's like saying, okay, now what I was calling neuron one is neuron two. And what I was calling neuron two is neuron three, et cetera. It's kind of a, a rotation of indices. And uh, this can be implemented by a simple uh, linear uh, uh, layer that would just be uh, doing that shift operation. And um, by applying that uh, elementary shift again and again, you can have all possible angles of rotation. So you can think of it as a recurrent linear layer that is applied again and again. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, yeah, there is a question uh, from the back. Uh, so, so, so in the beginning, you presented quite an abstract view of how, how the real brain works with recurrences. Uh, has anybody tried to implement the neural network using? That that's structure directly. Um, using recurrence. Yep. So if we talk about recurrence, you know, there are no recurrent neural networks. Have have anybody tried to implement the the type of recurrence that that you showed? Is yes. Uh, yes, yes. There there is some work in in just implementing some recurrence structure in deep nets for vision. Uh, Ayan Nayebi, um, Aran Nayebi is uh, is one big proponent of this, and also from this lab, the Di Carlo uh, lab in MIT, uh, where they have tried to uh, put some recurrent connections inspired by the brain. Um, they do find some minor improvements, but on some uh, kind of uh, networks that are not state of the art, right? They've been kind of exploring this uh, parameter space of recurrence on uh, small, rather small networks. And so the problem is that these results are very far from uh, state of the art. And um, I think another problem is that the parameter space to implement this, uh, this type of recurrence is very, very large. There's so many ways to do it. And so, I'm taking another approach that we really try to understand from a computational standpoint, uh, you know, what is the principle at play? And, and then we'd like to maybe implement it as, as a recurrent uh, process rather than uh, just trying, in, in, you know, in the dark to implement some recurrence, but it's also a valid approach. Okay, uh, thanks again for the talk. I think we are just uh, running uh, slightly out of time. So let's okay. say we can have a new speaker. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this was great. Uh, thanks, Ipan. And uh, yeah, I hope we, we can get the chance to, to see you around here another time for another talk. Uh, awesome. Bye. Okay, thanks. thank you for the kind invitation again. Bye-bye.